All right, guys, how's it going? Last night, I met up with two people from Intel who provided me with samples of current and future chips. Among them was the 10900K, which we know is still 14 nanometers, but the selection also included, to my unbelievable surprise, two 10 nanometer console APUs, and wait for this, a 7 nanometer desktop CPU. Now, I woke up around three hours ago as I write this very paragraph and I thought to myself, what a crazy dream that was. And I'm not kidding, I actually did truly dream that last night that that had all happened. The harsh reality of waking life is somewhat different though. That 14 nanometer 10900K exists, of course, but Intel's 10 nanometers is in such poor shape in both characteristics and yield that it would never make a suitable manufacturing process for a console APU. But what about the last one? A 7 nanometer desktop CPU from Intel. What an enticing thought that is. And for the past year and a bit now, we've been hearing from Intel's chief engineering officer and group president of the TSCG, Dr. Venkata, better known as Murphy Rendichintala, that Intel was very pleased with their progress on 7 nanometers, which according to him was still on track. And Murphy made some interesting comments about both Intel's extremely troubled 10 nanometer process and the new 7 nanometer process at NASDAQ's 39th investor conference. 7 nanometers for us is a separate team and a largely separate effort. And we are quite pleased with our progress on 7. In fact, very pleased with our progress on 7. And I think that we have taken a lot of lesson out of the 10 nanometer experience as we defined that and defined a different optimization point between transistor density, power and performance, and schedule predictability. And multiple times over the past 18 months, we basically heard the same reason why Intel failed at 10 nanometers. According to Render Chintala, the problems with 10 nanometers are directly related to the fact that Intel chose not to introduce EUV at 10 nanometers, but also that they went for a very aggressive 2.7x scaling factor. Now, a more typical scaling factor would be somewhere between 2.0 and 2.4. That's what the likes of TSMC would be doing, it was what Intel was doing previously. But for some reason, even though we know that 14 nanometers had given Intel problems, like they'd basically never had before, they still went and decided that for 10 nanometers, they would get even more aggressive. That strategy clearly failed, spectacularly, and just a few months ago, Intel's CFO, George Davis, was stating flatly that 10 nanometer will be less productive than 22 nanometers and also 14. But they're still excited about the improvements that they're seeing before ending that they expect to start the seven nanometer period with a much better profile of performance over 10 nanometers starting at the end of 2021. So in a nutshell, Intel were just too aggressive on their 10 nanometer attempt, but a new team will fix it at seven nanometers and they won't be quite as aggressive this time. There's never any indication of any long-term troubles or any question even that the rot had firmly set in at the manufacturing group. And to be blunt, I believed Murphy, and I too stated multiple times in multiple videos that I believe that Intel will get their act together on 7 nanometers again, and that it'll be a decent node, but likely still not quite on parity with TSMCs, which would actually be TSMCs 5 nanometers. In other words, it wouldn't be amazing, but it wouldn't be a disaster either, like they're having on 10. And one of the reasons why I believed that was, Murphy very quickly established himself as a plain talker when it came to Intel's issues. And it wasn't long after Intel poached him from Qualcomm that he wrote this internal memo which got leaked out to the press. And it said, Over the last three months, I have conducted numerous project reviews with our execution teams and there is a clear trend that has emerged in these reviews. A lack of product and customer focus in execution that is creating schedule and competitiveness gaps in our products. And to address these shortcomings, Murphy was going to create three-person teams of leaders from across Intel's business functions for each of a half dozen key products, among them the forthcoming generations of Intel's microprocessors. But what was quite telling to me was... This final part of the memo, where he says, this will be a challenging shift and I need your active participation and support to institutionalize the model. 
And also, I will need your help in quickly identifying the best internal people to fill these important roles and where appropriate, place the right external hires in these roles to drive success. This was April 2016, long before Intel went on to hire the likes of Jim Keller and Raja Kaduri to fill these important roles. And as you know, I have many contacts within Intel and at various levels. I don't know who everyone is though, and I don't ask, but there's a couple that seem to know an awful lot and at a pretty high level. And as you're all well aware of, only last month Jim Keller resigned from his position at Intel, effective immediately. Family reasons were cited, however, I very quickly started to receive information from some insiders that led me to believe that there was a bit more to it than that. All year, in fact, since January, I've been hearing and reporting about the power struggles at Intel, most of which appear to revolve around Keller, Murphy, and Raja. Let me just go over some of the quotes I have on this. Raja will be gone this year, that's 2020, probably the third quarter, which we're in now, due to a huge power struggle he's having with Murphy. Raja is being undermined and all of his resources are being taken away. Following up from that, it is doubtful that we will even see DG2 produced. Obviously the follow-up to DG1. And also, DG3 is gone from the roadmap and it was 100% Raja's architecture. And you can see my response to this. I asked, what's Murphy doing? I've hardly heard a thing from him in months. And the response a few days later was, Murphy is trying to kill off all of his internal CEO competition. And just so you know, this source is 100%. Literally never got anything wrong. Now, I was actually surprised that Murphy wasn't made CEO last time around, after Kazanich was fired. Or, sorry, resigned. And I guess Murphy was as well when Bob Swan was given the job instead. But since that point, I've been told stuff like, Swan will probably be forced out within the year. Again, this year. And that Intel will probably look to replace him with an engineer. That kind of leaves Murphy in a tight spot because he needs the world-class engineers working around him, but he doesn't need the competition for CEO, especially not after being overlooked the last time around. But anyway, now that that bit of background to all this is done with, let's move on to the main topic in the video title. A few days ago, I was sent a simple message which said, Intel 7 nanometer is off track by 12 months at the least and there will be no farming out of product to TSMC. That last part reminded me of a call that semi-accurate Charlie had with Susquehanna a week earlier, when he noted, several of Intel's projects, including the major ones, were going to be at TSMC. And apparently, Jim Keller was the one who was pushing for more projects at TSMC. But Jim and Murphy were butting heads as of last year on technical decisions. And last night, I logged on to Twitter and I noticed that my feed, my notifications had lit up. The reason being this slide here. Right down at the bottom, in the middle, 7 nanometer CPU products push out. To around about 6 months delay, due to around a 12 month delay of the 7 nanometer process yield. And this presentation was part of Intel's second quarter 2020 earnings call. And as it's Intel, they of course made billions of dollars in profit again. Well, let's take a look over at Seeking Alpha's transcript to see what has transpired with 7 nanometers in more detail. CEO Bob Swan took to the stage and said towards the end of his presentation, Turning to our 7 nanometer technology, we are seeing an approximate 6 month shift in our 7 nanometer based CPU product timing relative to prior expectations, with the primary driver being yield which based on recent data is now trending approximately 12 months behind their internal target. However, they have identified a defect mode in their 7 nanometer process, which has resulted in this yield degradation, and that they have root caused the issue and believe there are no fundamental roadblocks. Now, if that sounds pretty similar to what Intel's previous CEO, Brian Kazanich, said about 10 nanometers in 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018, then you'll understand why I would take all of this with a grain of salt. Especially if you consider what the same guy and his predecessor said about 14 nanometers as well. There is a history of delusional thought at Intel, which is even more concerning than their 
ability to yield a process. But moving on, and Bob now says that Intel expects to see initial production shipments of their first Intel-based 7 nanometer product, which is a client CPU, in late 2022 or early 2023. Now it says client CPU, in Intel speak, this generally means laptop CPU. So imagine something like Lakefield again, or some ultra mobile thing. Almost certainly this over a larger desktop CPU. Further backed up by the following quote, where Bob says that in addition, they expect to see initial production shipments of their first Intel-based 7 nanometer data center CPU design in the first half of 2023. 2023. Now, in my last video, Zen 3 is an integer machine. I noted that Intel's upcoming 10 nanometer Ice Lake server parts look to be extremely mediocre, with some fairly abysmal core counts and clock speeds at a pretty astronomical looking 250 watts. And this was the good part, believe it or not. This second part was really, really poor. And now we've just learned that they're basically going to be stuck with this woeful 10 nanometer process until 2023. In the data center, and this will be the earliest, by 2023, AMD will be on 3 nanometers or very close. And even when we do finally get desktop parts on this 7 nanometer process, it's likely going to be some bizarre x86 and ARM hybrid that nobody in the desktop gives a flying about anyway. But that was pretty much it for Bob's disclosures. And well, you can probably imagine how the question and answer session looked. First question, 7 nanometer delay. Next one, 7 nanometer delay. Sticking on the same topic of 7 nanometers, and this analyst will also be sticking on the same theme of 7 nanometers. And no huge surprise when Stacy decided to stick to the same topic of 7 nanometer delay. And as Bob did his best with a bad job, basically, at the end of it, he was forced to conclude that he is not happy with their 7 nanometer process performance. And when you look at these numbers, you see just how important this is. Intel down 16% today, AMD up 15%. This is all based in this one part of news, the 7 nanometer process. As always, I'm going to summarize with a bit of analysis. And as always, I've tried to give you the big picture of what and why. You can choose to believe what I've told you all year and in previous years or not. That's up to you entirely. And if you're an Intel fanboy who chooses not to believe this, then what is it that makes you continue to believe that this company is on anything other than the road to absolute disaster? The answers to why the company is on the road to absolute disaster are, I'm afraid, manifold. This is not one thing that one person can fix. And in previous videos, I very rarely talked about Murphy in terms of the drama going on inside of Intel. But I have at least three sources who all point the finger squarely at Murphy being on a power trip. Once again, just let me say that personally, I have got absolutely nothing against Murphy or anybody else in this video, in fact. I am simply reporting to you what I've been told, as it is my duty to do so. I'm also aware that in this Something Wrong at Intel graphics video, that it was Raja who was mostly getting the stick for his power trip. But I have rarely heard of any politics where Murphy wasn't involved. And if playing politics is his game, and to be blunt, he moved very, very quickly after moving to Intel, then he has surely played that game very well if we assume that he really has undermined Raja's position and was at least partially responsible for Jim Keller's resignation. But the problem for Murphy is, as he was promoted and took on more responsibility, he also took on the majority of the responsibility for 7 nanometers. If he didn't, who else did? Keller's gone now. Nobody said that he was responsible for 7 nanometers at Intel though. So who is going to take the fall for this? Well, Murphy... He is a guy who for nearly two years has been telling us all that 7 nanometers was fine. It was a new team, not the old broken team, and it was a team which he almost certainly helped to create. But that team has clearly failed just like the previous teams have at the new node. And even with this supposedly easier 2x scaling instead of the 2.7x, Intel has still failed to deliver at 7 nanometers. And now Bob Swan. A guy who, to be fair, has impressed me with his honesty is now saying publicly that he is not pleased 
with Intel's 7 nanometer process performance. This might well be him starting his fight back. And so, the power games at Intel look set to continue for some time yet. And as long as they do, we can expect more delays, more failed products, and more disastrous news. And with that, I'll leave you with the final quote from the same person who told me that all this was going to kick off a couple of days ago. The very next day, they followed up with this. 7 is looking worse than 10. I'll catch you later, guys.